Thank you, George, for that introduction and hello, everyone. I'm going to be speaking to Sir Howard Davis today about what leaders can do to drive sustainable business. Um, uh, uh, Sir Howard Davis is um, the chairman of NatWest Group, formerly RBS, and has led many businesses over his illustrious career, including having been the, um, the first chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority, as well as a deputy governor of the Bank of England and a director general of CBI. So he has a great outlook on what it's possible for leaders to do to drive uh, what's important to an organisation as well as corporate culture. Now, so Howard, um, NatWest last year announced that it was going to become a purpose-led um, bank, and um, I'm just very interested in understanding how that came about and what it's meant in terms of how it's now doing business differently. Well, it's quite a story, actually, and we began to think about our future orientation, if you like, I, I don't I distinguish it from, from strategy, um, about oh, almost two years ago. And, and a number of people on the board and in the executive at the time, and at the time our chief executive was Ross McEwen, began to be interested in the idea of a purpose-led company. And we had a couple of uh, consultants and NGOs come to talk to us about what a consultant-led business would look like. And we have on the board uh, something called our Sustainable Banking Committee, which actually we've had for a few years, and but that was the natural place in which to think about this. And we had uh, some people from outside who, who made some suggestions about uh, sustainable banking, and they were all rather well-intentioned, but the honest truth is that they didn't really inspire the board exactly. And our first couple of attempts to devise a purpose were the classic um, camels, if you like. You know, the old phrase that camel is a horse designed by a committee. And they were like that. You know, they were deeply unmemorable and probably not actionable in any way at all. Um, and so that was the position we were in. And, and in fact, also, if we look back, we were doing it in the in the last year of Ross McEwen's uh, chief executive ship. I mean, he, he knew that he was planning to, to leave at the end of 2019. It was all a very well-planned transition. And really, when Alison Rose came in, there'd been a lot of ground clearance done about what a purpose-led strategy might look like. But frankly, we hadn't reached a conclusion. And Alison picked it up um, and ran with it. And fairly quickly managed to produce a formulation, which is that we champion people, um, helping people, uh, families uh, and businesses to thrive. And we picked that up and then began to turn that into uh, some actionable elements of our future strategy. And the board, by that time, was very comfortable with it because we'd spent a lot of time. So I think the time... Uh, as it were, not producing a purpose statement was not wasted because by the time we had one, you know, we had got our minds around what it meant. And we'd also, I think, particularly realised that it wouldn't make any sense unless you could find a way of sort of uh, actioning it within the business um, and finding concrete examples of how the purpose strategy would make things would, would make things different. And so that's been the key focus that uh, Alison has um, spent her time on, turning a, a sort of high-flown purpose statement into a set of actual changes in the business that people can understand and, and get behind. So has that meant uh, a, a fundamental difference to how NatWest conducts its business now? Have, you know, has there been a decision made to focus on certain kinds of customers, not on others, you know, going into certain areas of business, abandoning others, that kind of fundamental transformation? Or is it really about messaging? I think, to be frank, it's probably somewhere between the two. I mean, bluntly, if you are a big clearing bank with 19 million customers, 
the idea that you can wake up one morning and say, do you know what? We're not going to do any of that. Um, we're going to do something completely different is, well, that's not realistic. Um, you, you happen to be a NatWest customer uh, or whichever clearing bank you know you are a customer of, and I'm sure you're a customer of one of them in the UK. If you then discovered that they just dropped you a line and said, by the way, we're not providing current accounts anymore. We're not actually doing money transmission. We're not going to operate a payment system and your credit card won't be functioning. Um, you know, you'd be a little bit disappointed probably. Uh, so realistically, the core of the business has to remain responsive to our clients. But it's not just messaging because in a number of areas, we have decided to make quite material changes to our business. One of them is obviously climate, and maybe we'll come on to talk a bit more about that in a bit more detail later. Uh, but we've made some very significant climate commitments, which are consistent with our purpose. But also, we have begun work, well, more than begun work, we've got quite a long way, in looking at our customers in quite a different way and looking at their life cycles, if you like, and saying, how do we orient ourselves to address the financial needs of our customers through their lifetimes? And so be much more relationship focused rather than transactional focused. And that has meant doing things like pushing financial health checks out through our networks, where if you go into a NatWest branch, you'll be asked rather than trying to sell you just a credit card or a, an extension to your mortgage, you'll be invited to go through with one of our people um, a structured approach to thinking about what your financial needs really are. And you might leave the branch discovering that your financial needs are not the ones you thought they were when you walked in. So there's quite a lot of examples of how we are reorienting the way in which we deal with our customers in a manner that is consistent with our purpose. But I don't diminish the fact that there is some messaging uh, in there as well, but it's not just messaging. It actually is about the way we interact with our customers and the types of products and transactions that we are going to do with them. Do, do, you said that the two years that the board spent thinking about this before coming up with a final strategy were, were helpful in terms of deciding uh, what was needed. Having been involved in, in a number of other boards as well, do you conclude that a change like this can be brought about by a leadership? Or do you think an institution has to go through sort of a fundamental change like the global financial crisis, like the pandemic at the moment, in order to sit back and think we need to do things differently going forward? I think it can be brought about by leadership. And I think the example of NatWest uh, does demonstrate the truth of that. If you like, the RBS, as we were until a year or so ago, went through a, well, I wouldn't even say it was a near-death experience. It was sort of a death experience, actually, not in the sense that in 2008, had the bank not been bailed out by the government, you know, it would have folded up. Um, it was unable to fund itself uh, in uh, September 2008. Now, in those circumstances, uh, you know, you might say, well, that's a good example of how you reorganize a purpose. And that would have been a catalyst for a completely new purpose. But actually, the task for the first few years after the crisis was a really much more basic one, which was to get the business back into a position where it could survive on its own two feet. And that involved getting rid of a lot of businesses all around the world, which were simply not viable. Uh, it involved getting out of a lot of very complicated structured transactions, which uh, had embedded in them huge financial losses. And so for quite some time, although the bank you know, did uh, talk about its, its strategic approach, its strategic approach was to get back to a position in which it might be viable, uh, because at the time it was not. And as you may recall, it recorded the largest ever corporate loss in the UK and all of that. 
So really, in our case, I think it wasn't until we had got the business back into a viable state and had begun to pay dividends again so that we were standing on our own two feet, we were actually remunerating our shareholders. It was really only then that I think we had the freedom, if you like, to determine a new strategy for ourselves. I fear that had the bank come out with a purpose statement in 2009-10, you know, the response in the public would have been, well, that's all very well, but one purpose you might have is to um, get yourself to be at least viable and profitable and give us a little bit of money for our investment. I think, I think that there would have been a deep degree of cynicism had we tried to come out with uh, that kind of statement um, uh, 10 years ago. I just think it would not have been believed and would probably have set us back quite a long way. So in a way, the decision to go for the purpose was a sign um, that we felt we were now a normal bank, you know, that and people there wouldn't be a loud raspberry across the country if we came out with a with a purpose statement of this sort. And there wasn't. So we judged it correctly, I think, at that point. But I'd, so in our case, it was leadership driven and it was not as a result of some major discontinuity because we'd had that a decade before. And that was so bad that it couldn't really plausibly have led to a new purpose statement at that point. And yet so many organisations right now are going through um, a fundamental reconsideration, I think, of what their purpose is, what their obligations are to, to com the communities, to their employees as a result of the, the pandemic that we're living through. Um, and so this is, in a way, the time for those organisations to have a look at what they can do as responsible businesses. I was very struck about what must have been in the water in 2019, because not only was an organisation like RBS thinking about purpose, but the, the US Business Roundtable, as I'm sure you'll recall, issued a statement about the purpose of a corporation being not just responsibility to shareholders, but also to to customers, to employees, and to the community more generally. So, I mean, that was made, that was a pre-pandemic statement, and yet that kind of sentiment is very much in the air at the moment. Do you, do you see NatWest sort of having created um, a trend now that is likely to be followed, certainly by other financial institutions or, or UK businesses? Well, I wouldn't want to give us the credit for creating a trend, though I think we're a fairly early mover. We're not the first mover in this area. And as you say, uh, in the States, there's been quite a lot of movement in this area. I mean, Larry Fink has been uh, very prominent. Um, and in the UK, of course, you know, there are companies like Unilever who talked uh, this kind of language um, for the last three or four years, probably maybe even longer, and so I wouldn't. I would. I would claim that we are um, an early mover or a fast follower, if you like, rather than um, people who are inventing something completely radically different. But I think in the banking sector, we are reasonably well positioned. Um, all banks are struggling with the same sorts of issues in relation to their communities, whether it's. Uh, financing climate change and getting out of financing um, bad things uh, on the one hand, um, or whether it's coping with the problems of um, the shifting ways in which people do banking uh, and therefore the decline of the branch network. But that becomes a very emotive subject in particular communities if uh, when you close a branch. So we're all coping with the same kinds of pressures, but I think we're doing them in somewhat different uh, ways, as is appropriate in a competitive marketplace. So, you know, we would hope as well that this would be, uh, over time, a competitive advantage for us, but it's probably too early to claim that yet. And, and yet, if you go into the market and you make a statement about purpose, um, you know, people in the market are then very quick to point to uh, where they're 
the potential conflict. So, for example, you know, branch closures or having certain we, we've been touching on climate change without really addressing it. But, you know, having clients who, for example, um, are contributing uh, to, to to carbon emissions when it comes to, you know, potential accusations of, of rhetoric versus reality. How do you as an institution balance that? Do you sort of decide that you know, there, there has to be an element of pragmatism or does it mean taking a very firm position on some of those issues? You know, do you give up certain clients, for example? Do you keep unprofitable yeah. branches open? Uh, the answer to both of those, I think, is uh, in some cases, yes. I mean, I think that the, diff the different thing about um, being a bank uh, as opposed to being a manufacturer or whatever is that almost all of what you do, and this is true in climate change, is really through somebody else. Um, you know, I mean, making a bank climate neutral is bluntly not that difficult a thing. Because, you know, we we just employ a bunch of people with a set of bits of IT and a few buildings, you know, um, and that is quite a straightforward thing to make to make uh, carbon neutral. And um, the key thing is, of course, how our financing affects the climate through the people we lend money to. So we're usually we're operating at one remove, if you like. And similarly, actually, frankly, the way branches work. I mean, we are responding to changing customer patterns. Um, and so quite a lot of the branch closures of us and uh, ours and other branches uh, are because, you know, the footfall has gone away. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, it's that a big out of town shopping centre has been built and the high street has kind of det deteriorated to the point where and the people are not going there to do any significant transactions. You know, there's a tattoo parlor and a couple of charity shops and possibly one branch of one bank clinging on. But, you know, where the footfall is, is elsewhere. So often the branch is not that we are closing branches in order to stimulate change in that community. We're responding. So we're usually behind the curve, frankly, because we are responding to customer, customer need. So... The difficult thing for us is to ensure that we are providing what our customers want when they want it um, and explaining how we are responding to changing patterns. So I think that's really how we think about the branch issue. Um, you know, the huge majority of our transactions now are carried out in a digital form. Very, very few uh, are require physical presence uh, in branches, although the branches do have some utility in providing advice services and that kind of thing, or, you know, financial health checks, as I mentioned. Um, in the case of climate change, I think there is a balance to be struck there. And I think that banks are going to be taking a more active role in the future than they have in the past. And that's partly because it's what we think is the right thing to do, but it's also partly because the Bank of England and the regulators, and this is true in other countries as well, are saying, look, this is not just a, and the, or, you know, that this is not just a welfare question, it's also a financial stability question. And that if you are lending to a lot of companies, who are assuming that they can use assets in the ground. I mean, to take it in the simplest, you know, you're lending to an oil company and it's secured on reserves of oil in the ground. And if it's not possible for them to extract that oil and use it because that's incompatible with legislated commitments on net zero, then what's the value of your collateral exactly? Um, and therefore, you know, you're going to find yourself losing a lot of money um, and that, you know, market, financial markets are going to be significantly disrupted. So we've got the central bank coming at us from that angle and saying, just a minute, you know, you need to look at the riskiness of your portfolio because some of what you think is collateral is not 
going to be helpful to you when you come to get that loan repaid. Um, uh, and then also, of course, we have uh, our customers uh, who are increasingly concerned about climate change and wants to see businesses acting in a forward-looking way. Now, the way we've rationalised all of that is to say, essentially, well, we've got some specific commitments on coal and oil and things like that, but that we have said that we will, in future, want only to do business with people who are either um, climate neutral themselves or who have a plausible transition plan, which is compatible with the targets that the government and the various COPs uh, have set out. So we want to see for oil companies that they have a transition plan that is compatible with the Paris commitments. Now, that will probably change as well as commitments change, as COP26 probably will develop further commitments. So we will have to adjust and adapt those. But we have been quite active, I think, in going to clients and saying, you know, you need a transition plan or we're not going to be able to do business with you as we have done in the past. Uh, and that's partly our decision, but also with, frankly, some pressure from the regulators too. And can I ask how customers broadly, I guess, not just those affected customers, how customers and shareholders have responded to the change in purpose or the, the focus on a purpose driven business? Yes. Well, uh, take shareholders. Um, of course, most of our shareholders are institutional shareholders or in our case, unusually uh, the government. But the government have, um, you know, take a rather hands off approach. You know, they've made it clear that they are you know, want to sell their, their stock. And so they don't they don't actively drive our strategy. And most of the institutional shareholders have got strong uh, ESG focuses now um, and they are quite keen to know what our approach is. And I think that's partly because some of them feel that you know, they need to respond to the pensioners and uh, the individuals on whose, uh, whose money they are managing. Uh, but also, I think, because they have themselves recognised this financial stability point um, and that they don't particularly want to own shares in companies whose business model is going to be fundamentally invalidated by climate change commitments, um, whether by regulatory commitments or indeed by just the, the, the physical impact of climate change on them. So we get quite a lot of pressure from shareholders um, to, but of course the shareholders, they're not terribly specific about what they want. You know, they come and say, what are your climate change commitments? What are your climate change plans, etc.? And they want to see that you have thought about it and adapted the principles to your business. So, yes, there's pressure from shareholders, but it's not do this, do that type of pressure. It's, it's questioning as to what our strategy is. Now, individual customers, of course, it's more difficult to get an idea of what they actually think. I mean, you can look at overall opinion polls because if, you de if you've got 19 million customers, you know, you're, you're pretty broadly spread across, across the country. And I'm sure you can find people among that 19 million with every possible view on climate change, you know, from some deniers at one end of the spectrum to some extinction rebellion people at the other end of the spectrum. So I, I think it's probably difficult to say what our retail customers think. Um, the only indications we might have there are whether they are interested in things like green mortgages. Um, uh, and increasingly, that is the case, although it's, it's still relatively small at the moment. But, you know, so you can get some indication. Uh, but overall, I think it would be tough to say what our retail you know, customers really think uh, about climate change beyond, as I say, the national uh, opinion polls, which suggest that there's been quite a significant move of public opinion towards believing that climate change is a uh, at least very significantly man-made and b um, that it is a very significant threat to our way of life. So I think you know you've got a you've got a receptive audience in the in the in the population as a whole, albeit 
there. There's still a range of views, I'm quite sure. As for business customers, well, um, business customers uh, are pretty interested. I mean, I don't think that we've had any really firm pushback. I mean, I have not had a single letter from a corporate customer saying, what the hell are you doing asking us for a transition plan? You know, um, I mean, uh, you just don't get that kind of resistance because most businesses can see um, that this is coming down the track. And if they think they're not going to be able to buy a diesel van from 2030 onwards, you know, they're starting to think about the electrification of their fleet. And, and if, you know, so it's, it's not something where we're getting a resistance. Now, I'm sure in detail, when we get to the point of saying, well, is this a credible transition plan? I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we will find some disagreements. It'd be odd if we didn't. Um, but I think most of our corporate clients are moving in pretty much the same direction at the moment. Hunt, you, you talked about ESG being particularly important to institutional investors at the moment, and indeed it's becoming important to financial institutions very generally. NatWest produced its ESG supplement this year to set out in a transparent way the approach that it's taking. Is that Was that something that needed a lot of thinking? Is that going to be a normal part of how you progress going forward? And um, you know, have customers, clients liked seeing that kind of information? Um, customers and clients, well, I wonder um, how many, you know, this certainly seems an odd thing to say, but I mean, I just wonder how many customers really digest that terribly well. And you, your first part of your question was, did we spend a lot of time on it? Yes, we did. And the audit committee um, you know, went through it in great detail. Do we think it's ideally constructed for informing customers and shareholders? Well, the ESG parts of our big shareholders, I'm sure, understand it, but it is quite complicated. And that's because at the moment, there is not a global agreement on what kind of disclosures in this area make sense. You know, you've got a whole range of different things. The World Economic Forum has produced stuff, there's thing called GRI, which has produced stuff. There's the Sustainable Accounting, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Now the International Accounting Standards Board have issued a consultation paper, which I was involved actually, on how they might integrate sustainability reporting into international accounting standards. There's the Task Force on Carbon Disclosures, which has been promoted by the Financial Stability Board. And there are a whole range of different disclosure templates, if you like. And we've attempted to meet as many of them as, as we can, because at the moment it's a little bit difficult to know which horse will win this race, you know, and become the the global standard, if you like. But, you know, do I think that we've got something which is really snappy and comprehensible and allows people to compare and contrast banks effectively? You know, my honest answer to that would be not yet, that's because, uh, but I think we, you know, that's more or less inevitable. It's difficult for one bank to say, well, we're just going to ignore this SASB stuff, or we're just going to ignore the TCFD, because there are different stakeholders who want you to report in these different ways. So I'm hoping that over the next three or four years, probably, we will get to a more standardized and more meaningful set of disclosures, so, you know, as we have done in the financial accounting area. Uh, and I think it's I think it's on the way. I think ISB will be the driver of it. And we would certainly welcome that. We, we started our discussion uh, talking about um, whether leadership can drive sort of sustainable change like this. And you talked about the role that Alison Rose had had in, in creating um, the, the, the purpose-led mission of the bank. Has that 
has that sort of focus on purpose now changed the board's approach to what you need from top management? Are you looking for different skills, a different approach to how to run the business in terms of the senior executives in the business as a whole? Well, one thing we have done which has changed the way they relate to the board is that we've altered our board paper structure. I mean, it's a banal point, but a significant one, I think, so that when executives bring papers to us, they have to say how this is compatible with our purpose um, and how they have thought about the decision in a purpose-led way. So they are required to do that, and we do ask questions about that, and that has changed the decision-making. Um, now, it follows from that that uh, people who come into the bank would need to be prepared to cooperate in that kind of framework. And that will therefore drive the sort of people who, whom we appoint. And I think we have a couple of examples already of people who have been attracted to come to the bank because of the purpose statement and uh, Alison Rose's enthusiasm about it. So I think over time you do get um, the people who want to work in the way you want to work. And anyone who's joining the bank now understands that they're going to have to work within this purpose framework and, un and understand that their business will be oriented in that way. So I think it happens. Now, whether we've, you know, you ask a good question, have we kind of changed our person's specifications, if you like? I'm not sure we quite have done that, but I think what we have done is to set out very clearly how the bank will operate in the future, and therefore that drives the kind of people who are interested, frankly. Uh, so I think it's been that way around, rather than our saying, we want purpose-led bankers. You know, uh, I, they haven't quite done that. And as a, a last question, can I ask you, are you surprised at the speed of change on this issue? It feels like in the last three years or so, this is you know, we're looking broadly at responsible business um, and across the ESG spectrum, this has become increasingly and quite quickly important to business when for many years before that, it was a, a nice to have that sort of sat in the background. Yeah, if, in a way, I, I am a little bit surprised and I think, I think it's probably appropriate to admit that, um, uh, particularly how uh, even the COVID crisis and the increase in unemployment and the uh, economic uh, financial pressures that's put a lot of people under. I don't think that that has made any difference to the attitude to climate change, for example, or indeed to purpose-led business in a, in a broader sense. And I think one might have wondered whether it would, you know, whether people would by now be saying, well, it's all very well, all this purpose-led stuff, but I want a job you know, and uh, I'm, I'm short of cash. And, uh, you know, that, but we, I don't think that's how, it's not that people are, are not concerned by unemployment. Of course they are, but I don't think it's dominated um, the, the other agenda in the way that it might have done. And there have been times in the past, I think, when, you know, once unemployment rises above a certain level, it's all people want to talk about. And that's not been the case, actually. I think people have recognised that the long-term challenges of business and society linked to the long-term challenges of climate change, being that um, this is not an optional agenda, you know, which you can kind of pick up for a while when things are good and drop when things are, things are bad. I think that's gone. I think it's now... This is now mainstream and is going to stay so. Well, on that sort of uh, uplifting message, Sahar, let me say thank you to you for this really interesting discussion. And um, I'm sure we've all taken a huge amount away from it. Thank you. Thank you.